Hello, does it work? Can you understand? Yeah, all right. Uh, I'm very nervous, you know. I usually am not so nervous anymore when I give concerts, when I play music. I realized within the last year I get really nervous when my students are playing. So I'm sitting in the audience uh, like a mother hen and, you know, being totally out. And now this comes additionally on it. I never hold a kind of a speech or so, so it is really incredible. Um, I'm very sorry for that already. Uh, I was trying to write down the speech until very late night yesterday, so it might be uh, very strange what comes out of it. I will try it. And I can see already the timing going down, so I will better uh, start doing, because I know that you appreciate your pauses. So let's try it. Well, first of all, thank you for, for inviting me here. I really appreciate uh, the possibility of a conference to exchange with fellow teachers, you know, about music, about piano especially. It's a wonderful thing, and then one of the nice uh, things I really started to appreciate when coming to Norway is this openness and this willing to exchange. You know, also at NMHO, it's so nice that we can just exchange some, sometimes students. We, uh, I sometimes uh, can teach totally other instruments because we're just talking about music. Uh, the other week I taught harp students that I never did before, or accordion. Uh, which was so nice. On the other hand, my students also go to other instrumental teachers, you know. So, and this is uh, a wonderful opportunity for me, and I look forward to exchange with you as well for that. And, uh, all right, let's try to do this thing. thing. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, don't do that. Oh, it's getting awkward already. So, today I saw myself before two options. Either I would share a very practical and daily life inside of why I love teaching so much and how I try to do it by playing a lot for you, by having a wonderful presentation digitally with a lot of pictures and audio files. And the other option was a very abstract and strange approach to share things that are going on in me and nobody has the nerves and wants to hear about it. And as you can imagine, I decided to choose exactly this now. It will be very strange and abstract because I would like to explore a potentially maybe different approach to our relationship with music. How we perceive it, play it and teach it ultimately. Therefore, first and foremost, I will attempt to describe my idea about music in general. So what is music? It could be seen as an attempt of communication but obviously it is so much more. So what is communication? It is this mysterious universal need that all of us feel, some more, some less, to express something we feel and to connect it with others. It is our incredibly lonely inner self, perhaps our soul hidden within us, seeking to connect and touch another person. Until today, we have not been able to fully make another person understand what we feel deep within ourselves. We use communication, such as words, to approach that feeling, which may have become a thought at some point. So we try to get as close as possible to this thought, to this feeling that we're having, and then we try to explain it to somebody else. We describe it. This is already one obstacle that can go wrong. We are no longer at the origin, the pure feeling, but we strive to get as close as possible through the power of our communication and then connect it with the receiver. Then the next obstacle is that the receiver must understand the words as they were intended, and even that can go wrong. Perhaps those words mean something completely different to that person, and they would use those words to describe something else. This is a significant problem we face when a composer tries to convey something through music in their mind and then with notes on paper. And we might not understand what is truly meant by it. And now in the realm of music, a third party enters, the listener, the audience. Potentially obstacles that could hinder successful communication are multiplied now. 
Um, now, let us take another dimension, um, self-observation. How do you think? What is thinking? Thinking can be understood as an attempt to bring one step closer a physical form of expressing a feeling, or let's say to impress a feeling, before we actually express it physically with words, for example. So, thinking. Observe yourselves now. Do you think in a specific language? Do you think in words? Maybe even in sentences sometimes? How do your thoughts make noise in your head? Or do you perhaps think in pictures or in concepts? Some of us think in a way, uh, some of us differently. But let's consider the example of thinking in actual words, as some of us do. Let's conduct a thought experiment. What if a human being grows up on a deserted island, completely alone, <clears throat> without learning a language? Does this mean that this person cannot feel just because they do not think in a language? No, they would still have a wealth of feelings, but they would directly experience them without having specific words for them in their mind. Maybe when a particular feeling arises again in a similar way, it becomes connected to the previous occurrence, and the person thinks of their own word or picture for that specific feeling. It gives it a name. This means that experience shapes language. From then on, the person can enrich that specific feeling with more and more experiences that align with it and are similar. But what if that person were to learn a rich language, like Norwegian, which I unfortunately cannot speak to you today, or German, which is really rich and um, somehow sometimes really endless in its uh, variation and expressions? expressions. Then, in theory, they could already know about feelings they have not personally encountered yet. This would create the existence of that feeling within them, and they could more easily expand upon it. We can read about war and maybe get a bit closer to what it actually felt like for the person who wrote about it. We can play a sonata by Schubert, and even though we have not experienced the same, we might be able to connect and feel something that we were not aware of before encountering that sonata. <clears throat> or we could be better prepared for that state of our feelings, mind and soul once we encounter an experience similar to Schubert's in our own lives. Therefore, this sonata enriches our mind, our feelings, maybe our soul. A quick, a quick excursion. Uh, one of the reasons we should refrain from sitting only in our practice studio and practicing perfect scales all day, even though the danger of that might be lower in this part of the world compared to others. However, it also does not mean that we should just go out and have fun, becoming slaves to our easy entertainment-driven world nowadays. It means experiencing life with as much awareness as possible. But how do we teach that? One step towards being or becoming more aware could be, for example, using this wonderful tool we possess, our ears, listening. In the age of uh, social media, short video clips and instant entertainment, this can be really a challenge for us. Concentration for longer than five-minute videos or 10-second TikTok videos, actually, today. However, at the same time, listening could become one of the things we need nowadays, especially more than ever, practicing concentration, focus, and awareness. With most students, I have to start practicing by playing a single note and listening afterwards what happens to it. The development, how it disappears, and how it ends. It seems to be a sickness with the pianist especially. Once a key is being played, we may forget about it because we think that we can't change it anymore anyways. 
However, a big part of a beautiful tone is actually how it ends. And to actively and with awareness control the end of a tone, especially as a pianist. Now I uh, catch myself with the idea that uh, this might be something which is maybe for more advanced students uh, and uh, maybe only for um, students who want to become prof professional pianists at some time or so, but I really truly be uh, believe that it is something especially also for children, for kids, that they can learn uh, to concentrate even better than us because they are not spoiled yet like we are for years with um, instant satisfaction in entertaining, you know, uh, we just have to perceive something that goes on on, a, on the screens or we have to listen to very, very easygoing pop music where you just receive, you don't have to do something on your own to really enrich it compared to a one-hour symphony of Mahler, for example. Um, children, especially when they are young, they are still shapeable, they can still learn this in a playful way, and it becomes normal for them. So I think especially um, for us teachers who are uh, working with children, this might be an important um, part. But how do we teach that actually to children? Uh, one tool could be storytelling, for example. Imagining stories when you are playing a piece. Um, sometimes when I taught children, then I imagined um, actual words for every chord for every um, expression in a phrase or sometimes even whole sentences and so on, just to make them aware that this is something more than just playing a note. It's a language that you can express, the story that you are going to tell. And I, I mean, if we would have enough time, I could um, uh, play for you an example, um, the wonderful Opus 14 number no. 2 of Beethoven, for example. Um, a piece that is... Um, misused very often as a children's piece and a very easy thing and, uh, you know, there are scales in it that you can practice and so on. Yeah, it's all true. But um, I tried to uh, make a story about that piece. You know, there is this wonderful family and everybody... Okay, I will very quickly do it. I have to look at the clock, but... Uh, there is this very happy family and all, you know, are... This is a very short form of that. Uh, I'm very sorry. So it, I, it cannot be very detailed. This very happy family, everything is in harmony. Everything is in G major or in D major. You know, sometimes in C major a little bit. So we don't go far away. Um, persons are very happy. A lot of expressions. A lot, a lot of um, laughter and, you know... Um, Maybe the grandfather also is laughing. <laughs> things like these, you know, very, very literal things that uh, someone can connect to something uh, rather than just playing a note. And then at some point, the grandfather gets a little bit irritated because he doesn't find his pipe anymore that he loves to smoke. And then this is, of course, the moment when it turns into minor. So in German, I would say, wo ist die Pfeife hin? Wo ist die Pfeife hin? Dirty, 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 dirty. You know? And um, so this whole story evolves, and in the end of the development section, of course, when uh, the big dominante is coming in, you know, it is the moment, aha, when he found the pipe again, uh, being played with a, with a fermata, and then everything is good again. Uh, you all know the piece and, and uh, the thing, so you can imagine that. But it's just uh, an example of how I tried, at least, um, to stop them from reading notes and going into the mode of actually imagining, creating something. So, uh, where should I continue again? Yeah. So if language is merely an attempt to express what we are feeling as closely as possible, but is never fully capable of doing so, then language could be a limitation for our inner feelings. However, a limitation does not have to be inherently negative. It can also provide, provide orientation and security. Some people find too much freedom and choice burdensome. 
rather than a blessing. But shouldn't it be our obligation as artists to dare to embark on this adventure and explore the boundaries of our limitations, of our feelings? Uh, let's take one step at a time. Before I mentioned the composer tries to describe something with music and then with notes, and we might, might not uh, be able to understand what he actually meant. Now, as musicians, we have a wonderful way to conceal that. First of all, most composers uh, cannot disagree with us on stage while we are performing, uh, because they are not there you know, for different reasons. And secondly, music, the craft of performing it, can still be beautifully expressed and deeply moving only by being like that. We, as performing musicians, find ourselves in a dilemma. If we understand music as a language, we can mostly read letters and words, yes, beautifully expressed, yeah, when we are musical, and sounding in an aesthetically pleasing manner if we are well-practiced and well-trained. However, sometimes we do not know or even ask ourselves why those words or notes were written. But do we have to know that in order to give a beautiful performance? I believe we do, because that search for the why might be the crucial difference between simply repeating a text, shaping it beautifully, then infusing it with feeling, and an actual feeling in first, and therefore recreating the moment of the piece's creation, and then using our craft to shape it. I strongly believe, and I really chose that word with, uh, on, deliberately, I really believe that this act of recreating rather than repeating possesses a power that humans understand in a concert or simply when playing for your grandmother. This belief, I think, we can call arts. This seems to be a good point to introduce the idea that we should not teach our students to practice at home just to repeat what they practiced on stage. So you are practicing at home, and then you repeat it on stage. Why? Because then you are more secure. You know what you want to do. But why shouldn't we teach our students to practice at home so that they don't have to repeat on stage what they practiced at home, but they can be free? Practically speaking, the muscle memory developed through practice provides the freedom for the mind to immerse itself in the possibilities of the composer's style, which we hopefully strive to research and understand. This brings the concert to life. It emancipates from pure craftsmanship and becomes a work of art. However, if we think that the why is not the foundation of everything, like I do, and we can still deliver a beautiful performance, then I believe the days of our artistic performances are numbered. And AI, probably, maybe, will do a much better job than us. When repeated and practiced, interpretation becomes primarily a craft consisting of technique, trained or planned musicality and perfection. A problem arises. It is incredibly tempting to take this shorter, easier path to practice something, repeat it on stage, quickly fulfill our own satisfaction because we have achieved what we planned, and maybe even meet the expectations of the less discerning audience, those who listen to a recording before the concert and expect confirmation. We have even created an entire world where this approach can thrive and flourish, such as competitions, where repetition on stage with minimal risk is encouraged, and recordings where we can edit out the last traces of a living soul in order to achieve perfection. Or I would rather call it steril sterility, is that a word? S being sterile? The quintessence of this is that I try to teach my students to search for what happened in the composer's head or heart before they wrote it down. Search for that moment of creation. In German, I call it Funken, or sometimes even Götterfunken, if you know that. Um, 
when it's incredibly, yeah, and we play so many incredible pieces. I try that, and I say I try because with all ne necessary modesty, I can only search and continue searching for that myself, and at some point begin to, to believe. However, in order to embark on this search for what happened before the composer wrote it down, we must understand the tools a composer uses, the words, the vocabulary, the grammar, the language. Therefore, we must learn what it means to compose in different times and places. During the Baroque period, particularly in Johann Sebastian Bach's time, there was no such thing as a pure piano or, in that way, harpsichord lesson. It was always a compositional lesson, integrated with expression and performance. A theme, a melody, a piece of music needed to be written down in its skeleton form and then be treated with taste and style, possibly ornamented in the moment, improvised, and clothed in various possible forms. That's why many of Bach's pieces have multiple versions, examples of how to handle the same piece of music. Some of these versions served as manuals or exercises for his students. And I think there comes a second problem. Uh, I talked yesterday already with some of my colleagues, uh, the problem of editions. For example, in the beginning of the 20th century, mostly there was only one edition from one Verlag uh, publisher. Um, for Bach, it was mostly Breitkopf and Hertel in Germany. So all these great artists, pianists that we uh, have on recording nowadays, you know, from the beginning, middle of the 20th century, they played from the same score because they didn't have any other possibilities. There was only a very, very little percentage of people who were able to access information like we do, do nowadays very easily with internet, for example, or by being uh, able to fly to, let's say, Frankfurt and go into the archives or to uh, Vienna and look into some of the autographs of Beethoven. At that time, it was not that easy. So they would rely on what was written, and they played it. It became so normal and self-evident that nobody asked themselves or asked, um, how, could I, how can I say it, put it in question, if that could be actually right or not, because everybody did it. For example, one of my favorite pieces, the Inventionen of Bach. I mean... Uh, <laughs> Everybody knows it. Again, another piece that is very often misused as something less than music. But actually, this is the version that everybody knows because it is the version that has been printed. There are three other versions um, that he also wrote down in order to explain exercises to his students. Uh, for example, using the ornamentation of passing notes. So. Became bowed out, you know, and then how you could use it as a tool to create a message in music somehow. Uh, let's see. What could I use? Yeah, when we have the long way. We can use the tool of passing notes to increase intensity, for example. Uh, these kind of things were so normal at that time and became so abnormal for us in the beginning of the 20th century purely because of editions, purely because of the lack of sources of origins that we could look into. So that is one of the reasons why all these great pianists, for example, uh, uh, they play only what is written in that edition, which is sometimes more than it was written because it's already phrased, slurred, uh, given um, dynamics in the style of the time, which was at that time the late Romantic then mostly. 
And on the other hand, it was written so much, so, 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 uh, so much less, if that makes sense, uh, than what it originally meant, because it was not necessary to write it down, or the origins, the other versions, were not known simply, because they were still in an archive hidden under uh, tons of dust and just being recovered within the last, let's say, 40 years. So, returning to the harpsichord, it was a very popular instrument during the Baroque era, playing a central role in solo and ensemble music. Aspiring musicians, especially those studying keyboard instruments, like the harpsichord, were expected to learn composition as well, obviously. Johann Sebastian Bach, <laughs> an accomplished composer, and keyboard virtuoso was renowned for his mastery of the harpsichord. He frequently composed and improvised music for the instrument, showcasing its cap capabilities and pushing its technical boundaries. Bach's own sons were also musicians and composers, received extensive training in both harpsichord performance and composition from their father. Many harpsichord teachers often included composition lessons, of course, as part of their instruction, teaching students the principle of harmony, counterpoint, and musical form. Students would learn to analyze and understand the works of the great composers of the time, such as Bach himself, and then apply those techniques in their own compositions or and in their own interpretations of others, using their personal dialect in form how to handle ornamentations, for example, improvisations. The integration of harpsichord lessons with composition lessons allowed aspiring musicians to develop their technical skills on the instrument while nurturing their creative abilities. It was a holistic approach aimed at producing well-rounded musicians capable of both interpreting existing words and creating new ones. And I hope in the end we all understand that this is the same thing, actually. It should be, at least for us. So now, if we can try to combine and make our students understand again a bit more what it actually means to compose, what the possibilities of our tools as a composer provide us to express, and how we use them, then we and the students can emancipate from being a handcraftsman and actually begin to create or recreate. It becomes authentic and natural. And probably a certain kind of mistakes are not happening anymore. I call these certain kind of mistakes the anchorman effects. You might realize sometimes when people are reading out texts loudly, for example, strange piano teachers that try themselves in written speeches, or anchorman, for example, that would do mistakes, mispronounce words they usually have no problems with in their normal life. They have a slip of the tongue. Versprecher, we say in German. When reading out a story loud, we might do mistakes we usually don't do when we speak freely. Why? Because we are in a different mode. We don't create. We barely reproduce something without having borne it from an actual feeling. We pretend and don't mean it if we are very crucial. So, if we read and play notes off the score, these kind of slip of the tongue happen, and we do mistakes. That we usually would not do if we actually knew first of all, but even more importantly mean what we are playing, because we know where it comes from. We know the why. Now, this, of course, is only speaking about this particular kind of mistake that sometimes can happen during a concert. Or it is because it is the first time in the concert that we are deeply aware of that passage. Since our mind joins comfortably muscle memory, the comfortable muscle memory, that we could always safely use when practicing at home and not being forced to add our minds as intensely as on stage. The consequence practice to practice stage awareness at home. And here comes in another important factor that can cause both joy and suffer on stage, psychology. Going back to our anchorman, in German are wonderfully horrible words that because everybody knows that they are traps on television or radio, it is nearly always mispronounced 
because people think already before they say the word, oh my God, now it comes. The word, for example, is authenticität. So if that difficult passage where you always make mistakes in the music anyways, now comes in concert, your psycho psychology has the potential to be not helpful. A way to succeed is to practice it, not only with the muscle memory, so that you know that you physically can pronounce the word, but also with a certain kind of mode and awareness in your mind that triggers the kind of intensity you are feeling on stage. How do you do that? Well, I would probably need another hour for it, but a short attempt. First of all, you have to get to know yourself on stage. Observe yourself. Observe the feeling, the mode you are in. The way how you perceive time, your heartbeat, how things sound, smell, feel, how you feel your senses on stage. And with stage, I already mean just playing for your friend or for your grandmother. It is totally different than just playing for yourself, as we all know, probably. Try to capture, to save it, and then to resummon it later. It probably won't work the first time, but every time you will be able to summon that better and better. Hence, you can practice differently. For some, it is easier who have a more natural approach to stage. For some, it is harder, who feel the stage to be a totally different world. And neither of those is better or worse than the other. Shortly before I end this, I want to go back um, to attempt to re-enter the actual topic, the importance of um, the act of composing as a performing artist. I would love us to try to see score as something living, as something organic, actually, and that is constantly somehow in movement. We have to understand that um, a score in a Baroque time meant something totally different than a score in Impressionistic time of Debussy. It was a different tool to express yourself differently. Things were self-evident that were not necessary to write down in Bach's time that uh, in Debussy, for example, it absolutely was. It is not a coincidence that the further we come within the last centuries, the more concrete composers went to be in what they actually want to be expressed, while a score of Bach or Mozart can be quite puristic a composer like, for example, let's take a Debussy again, is so clear and so specific with every note. But that doesn't mean that Bach was not exactly the same kind of specific, but maybe it just was not necessary. Um, and maybe there was also a certain kind of freedom because everybody was a composer, him or herself anyways, and had the right and duty, and it was a wonderful thing to add your own personal style to it. As I said, in form of interpretation, in form of improvisation, in form of ornamentation. And if we can try to explain to our students that a score is always only the attempt of the composer to get close to what he felt or thought of before he has written it down, we already would make a big leap, I think. And then, of course, there are people and composers who think within the limitation of a score, who can um, move perfectly within that limitation. For example, yesterday, Prokofiev is one of these composers I feel to be perfectly uh, having an orientation of what is possible and what not within the limitation of a score. And then we have composers who constantly struggle, like Schumann or Schubert, who you feel they need to break out, they want to go beyond. We have to understand that and try to see that in the scores and then to give it on, rather than just letting notes being played. So, originally I intended to discuss the importance of the act of composing as a performing musician. However, as I started writing this speech or essay or whatever you want to call it, I realized that the preparation and overture 
to the topic became longer and more complex. When I attempted to put it into words, it became much wider, because when I thought about it, or rather when I felt it, it was just a single feeling that had no descriptive word that has been invented yet. So with this lengthy and abstract preparation regarding the importance of the act of composing, with this little and shy step into that topic, you could even call it a cliffhanger, I would like to conclude my speech. Thank you for your attention. Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs>
um, if you can tell, if you can call them like that. Um, but yeah, the, it's, uh, everybody reacts totally different. And you know, they can surprise you, and they can surprise themselves quite often. You know, they go through periods, yeah. Uh, yeah, developments, which is really among the interesting perspectives about teaching. No, yeah. already from this age. To exactly. So, any other questions? He will not leave at once, but uh, maybe we give him a warm applause. Thank you. Thank you.